So this is um, joint work with with uh, Sebastian Riedel from University College London, who was my PhD advisor, as well as Pasquale Minervini from University College London, Thomas Demester from Ghent University, and Samir Singh from UC Irvine. And this workshop is on log logic and learning, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about what I find so exciting about machine learning and deep learning uh, specifically. I guess you are all familiar with these uh, breakthroughs over the last years, but uh, I want, just want to highlight a few that I found particularly um, mind-blowing. So here you have uh, visual question answering. You're given an image. You're given a natural language question. You can train neural networks to figure out the answer uh, to these questions. So for instance, uh, you have this uh, image of two school buses, and the neural network actually figures out that there are two uh, distinct school buses in the image and provides the right answer that there are two. Uh, we also have now uh, uh, computer vision models that can transform images to other images, um, doing very interesting transformations, such as replacing uh, zebras by horses, or turning uh, summer into winter, or turning a, a drawing of Monet into something that looks more photorealistic, or given a photograph, uh, generate uh, other uh, images that look like they've been painted by Monet, Van Gogh, and so on. Uh, there are also, uh, I guess, more practical applications. So for instance, Marvin Ziegler has been working on using deep reinforcement learning to synthesize chemicals, which I find extremely exciting. Uh, we have now um, computer vision models that are better than humans uh, at classifying uh, tumor cancer cells in images. Uh, we have really good uh, machine translation models. I mean, they're still, I guess, lacking behind in, in, in human uh, machine translation, but they get uh, quite complex sentences right. So there's a, it's a very uh, complex nested German sentence on the left, and the English translation is actually, as far as I can tell, uh, very great. Uh, I guess you're also familiar with uh, deep reinforcement learning uh, being used for achieving superhuman performance in pl playing Atari games. And then I think two years ago now, uh, Lisa Dorf uh, fought a, a game, I guess, against, against AlphaGo and, and lost, which was, uh, I guess, a big, uh, big thing for people uh, inside and also outside of machine learning. OK, so this is great, but um, at the same time, uh, you know, there's this, uh, this joke, person A comes to person B and asks, you know, this is the machine learning system you're using. And just, uh, person B says, well, yep, you put the data into this big pile of linear algebra, and then you collect the answers on the other side. This is what we're doing. <laughs> and person A says, well, what if uh, the answers are wrong? Well, then person B uh, says, well, you just steal the pile until it looks right. And uh, this is uh, unfortunately, I think, quite true for many of uh, the deep learning uh, research that, including myself, are carrying out right now. <laughs> so how can we fix this? Uh, well, my approach to this has been uh, to think about how can we get data and ex uh, how, we, how can we train these systems, not just from uh, individual label training examples, but how can we also get explanations into these uh, deep learning systems in form of rules, uh, partial programs, and maybe at some point even natural language. And then conversely, how can we get explanations out of these systems, again, in form of rules, induced programs, and possibly at some point natural language or plants. This is really uh, very much echoing what uh, many people in this uh, workshop has been uh, saying over the last two days. Uh, also, I guess, in, in very much echoing what, what Richard uh, just, just talked about. OK, so here in this uh, talk, I'll be uh, talking just about, I guess, logic. But we also have uh, work on you know, inducing programs or providing partial programs um, for making these, these models both more, uh, more data efficient, but also uh, more interpretable. OK, and if we go back a few uh, decades, then it's kind of interesting to see how people were um, approaching natural language processing. There were actually times where people were using Prolog for natural language processing. And then again, I'm really much, uh, very much echoing what uh, Richard just said. Well, if you have these uh, logic-based expert systems, then you, know, you, you don't need much training data uh, or no training data at all. These uh, systems are interpretable, but you have to manually define these rules, and they're going to be brittle if your data is uh, uh, noisy. And there's no generalization beyond what you explicitly define in these rules. And if we contrast that with neural networks, then we can train them end-to-end -end, uh, from task data. They achieve very strong generalization. Um, but we need a ton of training data, and generally, they're not interpretable. So I guess, as before, what is the best way to uh, get the best of these two worlds? <laughs> Right, and there's, I just want to emphasize this again. There's a really long tradition on combining machine learning and logic, as I guess you, most of you are aware of. Uh, I guess starting with fuzzy logic, probabilistic logic programming. We have seen a, a great talk by uh, Luke Durrett. Um, inductive logic programming, um, neural symbolic convectionism, and you know the list goes on. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is that there has been, I guess, some very recent interest in having a tighter uh, combination or integration of deep learning and symbolic uh, formalisms such as uh, logic tensor networks, tensor log, and the talk that you just uh, saw by, by Richard Evans. So I think it's a very exciting time to, to work in that, in that space. And yeah, there's also 
I guess, quite a few uh, review papers and, and books on this topic. OK, so what I'll be talking about is, first of all, I'll, I'll just restate again you know, what is the, the benefit of symbolic versus neural representations. And this is going to be very much uh, yeah, echoing, again, Richard's uh, points. Um, I'll introduce the ta task of link prediction, which I've been working on. And then I'll, uh, in the first half, um, briefly talk about some work that we did on regularizing uh, neural representations using logical rules. We have one model agnostic but slow approach, one fast but restricted approach, and then recently we published a model agnostic and fast approach. And I'll, as I said, briefly talk about these before then uh, going more into detail about this end-to-end differentiable prover architecture, with, which does explicit multi-op reasoning using neural networks and also induces logical rules using gradient descent. OK, so I guess you're all familiar with logic, so the notation should be clear to everyone. But I'll just uh, restate that again here, just that you also see the visual notation of this talk that I'll use throughout the talk. So we have constants like Homer and Bart. We have uh, universally qui uh, quantified variables like x and y. Uh, we consider terms that are, these are constants or variables. As with uh, Richard's talk, we don't uh, consider function terms. So basically, when I later talk about something that's inspired by prolog, I actually mean data log. And we have uh, predicates, like father of and parent of, which map terms to Boolean. And we have atoms, such as x is a parent of Bart. And we have literals, uh, which are negated or non-negated atoms. And then we consider uh, rules. So this is the most interesting bit to us. You know, rules where we have um, a body, which is a conjunction of, um, of literals. And then we have a hat, which is an atom. So at this point, again, we only consider um, horn clauses. And then we have facts, which, uh, you know, are also called rules, but they don't have a body. So these are ground rules with no free variables, uh, which don't have a body, such as whom as a parent of what. OK, so the task that I'm uh, interested in is link prediction. And uh, the reason is that any knowledge bases that we build, they are inherently incomplete. Right? So if we take a large knowledge base, such as Freebase, DBPD, or Yago, then if we look into these databases, we see that, well, uh, you know, the place of birth attribute is missing for 71% of the people. It's kind of odd because everybody has a place of birth. And also, we don't have uh, common sense knowledge uh, stated explicitly, explicitly. So we might know that somebody is a professor, but we might not have uh, knowledge that he's giving lectures, although almost all professors give lectures at university. Right, so what we would like to uh, be able to use is weak logical relationships that we can in use to infer facts. So for instance, we could be interested in whether Melinda lives in Seattle, and we could maybe use the knowledge that Melinda is the spouse of Bill, who is a chairman of Microsoft, which is headquartered in Seattle, to give us some evidence to believe that she's uh, living in Seattle. And just to I guess, as I said, rephrase what, what has been uh, said over and over at this workshop. Well, we can use uh, symbols, right? And the problem with symbols, in my view, is that we, uh, well, they don't share any information, right? Grandpa off and grandfather off, they mean uh, two completely different things unless you uh, really connect them using rules. Uh, you don't have any notion of similarity, apples and oranges, professor, lecturer, you, you, you can't, just by looking at the symbols, determine if they're similar or not. You have to somehow have rules that connect these. Um, so what we'd like to be able to do is we would like to be able to, given that we know that apple is a fruit, and given that we maybe have learned that apple is somewhat similar to an orange, uh, also infer that uh, orange is a fruit. And particularly, it's hard to work with uh, other modalities, such as language and vision, as Richard said, right? So I'm interested in uh, natural language instead of uh, images. But uh, yeah, here we have this example where uh, we have a predicate, which is, is a film based on the novel of the same name by. Right, if I take that predicate and treat it as a symbol, then in my data, I will see that predicate symbol maybe once or twice. So I have to come up with some compositional representation. I'll talk about that in, in a second. But when we have symbols, we can do very great things. Right? We can uh, have uh, you know, symbolic manipulations. We can have inference mechanisms. We can even get proofs for predictions. So here we know that Abe is the father of Homer. We know that Homer is a parent of Lisa. And we also know that Homer is a parent of Bart. And we also have this nice rule that says a grandfather is a fa father of a parent. So now we can ask, you know, who's Abe the grandfather of? And we get back the predictions, well, Lisa and Bart. And we can also get the proof um, by just yeah, seeing which rules have been applied. And uh, it's fairly easy to debug and trivial to incorporate domain knowledge. Right? We can take these rules. We can go to some domain expert and let her change and add rules. So, let me contrast that with neural representations. Um, and with that, I mean we take all the symbols, all the non-variable symbols, and we uh, represent them using fixed dimensional vectors. 
right? So we have apple, orange, farther off, and so on, and we have some kind of k-dimensional vector space where these uh, vector representations of these symbols live in. So it's pretty much like, let's say, word to vec, right? For every word, we have a, have a vector. Now, we can actually capture similarity and even semantic hierarchy, as, uh, as I'll show later, in this vector space. So if we want to make sure that grandpa off and grandfather off mean the uh, same thing, well, we can make these vectors arbitrary close to each other. Likewise, if we want to somehow encode that apples are somewhat uh, similar to oranges, we can, um, again, move these vectors closer and closer in, in the vector space. And maybe we know that every apple is a fruit. We could even have uh, this hierarchy, as I said, encoded in the vector space by making sure that the uh, vector of fruit is component-wise larger than the vector of apple. We can train them end-to-end -end, uh, from knowledge bases. And we can even have compositional representations now. So this is really the example that I showed on the last slide uh, with a slightly simpler predicate. Here, the predicate is the farther off. And we can compose a vector representation of that predicate by uh, running a recurrent neural network over the vector representations of the individual words. But we need a ton of training data. And it's not really clear how to incorporate uh, first order logic knowledge uh, rules like the grandfather of rule. So let me tell you a little bit of how people approach neural link prediction or link prediction uh, right now. Uh, these are extremely efficient models. They take uh, a ground atom, a fact like uh, Melinda lives in Seattle, and basically take just the three vectors, the, uh, the, the vector for lives in, the vector for Melinda and Seattle, and have some function that can be parameterized to directly estimate a score between 0 and 1. Right, so one of these uh, models is very simple. It's called distmalt. Uh, it just takes a trilinear dot product between these three vectors. There's a, a slightly more complex model called complex, which represents each of these vectors in a complex uh, space. And then you have um, the real part of the complex trilinear uh, product between these three vectors. So what's important to emphasize here is that, first of all, these models uh, don't look at any neighborhood of the ground atom. Right? We just take the ground atom and we directly try to estimate the score between 0 and 1. Um, that makes them um, extremely efficient. So at this point, we can really apply these to very large knowledge bases, which is a very nice property. Uh, we can define a training loss uh, similar to the one that uh, Richard showed, so some uh, cross-entropy loss, where given a known statement, a known ground uh, atom, we uh, basically try to maximize the, um, the negative log likelihood of uh, the sigmoid of that score that we got out of the neural link prediction model. And then we also have to uh, invent some uh, unknown statements. So we, we sample uh, unknown uh, ground atoms and pretend that they are false, and then you know, we, we can train this um, end to end meaning we can learn these vectors uh, using stochastic gradient descent. OK, so let me talk about how we can get logic back into this, this picture. Right? Again, here we don't have any neighborhood of these um, ground statements. We don't have any logical rules. So how can we get this back into this, into this framework? Uh, so one thing that we did was we regularized these uh, vector representations of symbols using propositional logic. So here at this point, we have a vector of, let's say, parent of and a vector of the entity pair Homer and Bart. And uh, let's say we have. Uh, three uh, ground atoms that we want to score. We want to know is uh, Homer the parent of Bart, is Homer the mother of Bart, and is Homer the father of Bart. So we get three uh, scores between 0 and 1. So these are the, the three uh, nodes at the top. And let's assume we also have this first order logic knowledge that a father is a parent but not the mother of uh, some person. So what we do is, is quite simple. We um, basically take a propositional logic rule. So we uh, you know, substitute x and y with the concrete uh, entity pair, Homer Bart. And now we get a, a score for the ground atom. That's just the neural link prediction model that I showed on the last slide. Any, of, uh, any neural link prediction model would do. And now if we have uh, a propositional rule that is 1 minus, uh, sorry, that's the negation of another propositional rule, then we take 1 minus the score of that propositional rule. If we have the conjunction, so if the propositional rule is uh, some other two propositional statements uh, that are in conjunction with A and B, uh, we can make a very crude assumption and uh, just assume that uh, the uh, probability of these two uh, proposition rules is independent, and we can take the product. And from there on, we can construct this junction and also uh, the thing that we most care about, implication. So what this means is that when we have these uh, three scores for the uh, three ground atoms, we can uh, use this first order logic uh, rule, ground it out, and add a loss term to our training objective. Right. So here we have now a, a computation graph, a model that would um, not only try to estimate the score of ground atoms, but it would also incorporate this propositional logic rule that I showed here on, on the bottom. Now we int we're interested in first order logic rules. So what we do here is we actually 
ground this out for every possible entity pair in the domain, and this is extremely slow. So what we then uh, did is, well, we tried this out on a, um, on a free base uh, knowledge base, and we looked at uh, a zero-shot learning experiment where we have a, uh, a relation for which we don't observe any atoms, any facts. So it's like you, you enter a new relation into Freebase and you want to fill it. And if we train a new link prediction model on that, and we ask basically for this new relation, uh, give me a ranking of all the entity pairs that are most likely, uh, uh, for which this relation most likely holds, we get completely random predictions because there's no information that connects that relation to any other relations. We get we initialize the model with random vectors, so really the, the predictions are random. This is what the, the three uh, that you see over here, this is uh, weighted mean average position, which is an information retrieval uh, metric. So this is really bad, and obviously really bad. But now let's assume that we have some logical rules that uh, would uh, connect the new relation with existing relations in the knowledge base. And now what we can do is we can just uh, you know, infer facts uh, symbolically, and that gives us uh, you know, a slight improvement, uh, actually quite massive improvement, three times better. But um, at this point, you know, we, we hadn't done any machine learning, so now we can think about how can we combine, uh, I guess, machine learning and, this, uh, uh, and, and symbolically inferring facts. So one thing you could do, for instance, is first run this neural link prediction model, then threshold predictions, and then uh, infer statements uh, symbolically. This, again, gives you uh, a, a very nice uh, boost in performance. Another thing you could do is you could first run um, uh, symbolic inference. So basically, you treat your logical rules as a way to augment your training data. So you're just inferring new statements, and then you use them in addition to the training set that you, that you had before. And that really helps you quite a bit, again. But the approach that I showed you previously, where we, on the previous slide, where we used these logical rules directly as regularizers on our neural link prediction model, that is what really uh, helped us most here. So this is the, uh, this, this blue bar over here, um, which outperformed these baselines of performing either uh, a symbolic logic inference before or after um, training a model. Right, so here we're really doing both at the same time in a way that we have this um, regularization on our vector representations. Okay, but as I said, this is extremely slow because we ground these first order logic rules. So then we thought about, is there a way to do this maybe for a restricted uh, class of uh, rules, namely direct implications between one predicate and another predicate? Uh, is there a way to do this more efficiently such that we are independent of the uh, number of uh, constants in our domain? So let's assume we have a rule that states every father is a parent and every mother is a parent. Now what we can do is we can say, well, this region uh, of vectors that are component-wise larger than the father of vector should be the region of predicates that are implied by uh, father of, right? So here we get a, we have a weird thing right now. We, you know, mother of would be implied by father of and parent of wouldn't. So what we can now do is we can define a loss term to restructure this uh, vector space such that uh, when we take this father of implies parent of rule, we would get, uh, we would you know, push the parent of vector to the upper right, and uh, we would also move the mother of uh, vector out of this uh, region of things that are implied by parent of. So now we get uh, this representation on the right. And what's really nice about this is that we might still have you know, training data that lets us to learn that dad of uh, is similar to father of, or that mom of is similar to mother of. So it means that the rules that we wrote down on the top left, namely that every father is a parent and every mother is a parent, now also generalize to other predicates for which we haven't stated any rules. Right? So we would now always also predict that of between two entities. Um, uh, sorry, would for that of between two entities also predict parent of between these two entities. And at test time, or uh, at, at some point, we might even uh, think about introducing a new rule, such as every parent is a relative. So we introduce a new predicate. And we directly know where to place that predicate in our embedding space, right? It needs to be living in that region of things that are implied by parent of. So we place it up on the top right. And again, for every mother of, for every mom of, for every father of, and dad of, we would also automatically uh, predict the, the relation relative of. To go a, a bit into details, so the way we do this, we have this first order logic rule on the top. We have, uh, basically what we want is we have a, a neural link prediction model which uh, it's basically a matrix factorization model. So you have a vector representation of the head and the body relation, and you have a vector representation of the entity pair. You just take the dot product between the two, and you apply some um, 
some monotonic uh, transformation such as sigmoid. So what you really want is for every entity pair in your domain to have uh, to make sure that the score of predicting the hat is larger or equal to the score predicting uh, in, in, predicted in the body of the rule. Right? Whenever I predict father off between two entity pairs, I should also predict uh, parent off uh, for these two entity pairs. So what that means is since the transformation that we apply to sigmoid is uh, monotonic and the neural link prediction model that we use here is very simple, we can actually uh, have a constraint that, uh, two constraints that directly uh, impose this, this uh, direct implication, namely by saying that, the, as I said, the, the hat um, pr predicate, the vector representation of that hat predicate needs to be component-wise larger than the vector representation of the body uh, relational predicate. So this is this uh, h uh, large or equal b on, on the left. And we also have to uh, impose a constraint on the entity pair representations, namely they have to be non-negative. So it's the guy on the, on the right. But if we have these two together, we can take any direct implication between two relations and we can very efficiently uh, just add it as a loss term on our neural link prediction model and restructure this uh, vector space of relations. So the problem is that now uh, you know, we can regularize um, by propositional rules, but that needs a ton of uh, um, well, computation because we need to ground all of these uh, first order logic rules into propositional uh, rules. Um, and it doesn't, as I said, scale to large domains. Or we have this lifted way that I just showed, but this is only um, working for a very um, restricted class of neural link prediction models and also only for direct implications. So wouldn't it be nice if we could combine, uh, well, the generality of the first approach with the efficiency of the second approach? So what we uh, proposed um, at UAI last year was to say, well, uh, let's say we have this first logic rule, arbitrary one. Um, and we need a grounding such that the neural link prediction model can learn something about uh, incorporating this first logic rule. So we now introduce an adversary that would generate for the neural link prediction model um, groundings or embeddings that, that correspond to, to groundings of this first logic rule. And then we have a min-max game between the adversary and the link prediction model such that the link prediction model tries to uh, predict um, the truthness of these ground uh, atoms and also tries to be consistent with respect f uh, to first logic rules and the adversary tries to find embeddings of grounding such that the neural link prediction model isn't good at, at this inconsistency con uh, constraints uh, for the first logic rules. Okay. So these were approaches that would take first logic rules, either propos propositionalizing them or not, and trying to regularize vector representations of symbols directly. So now I'm um, going to talk about the end-to-end -end differentiable prover, which basically uh, comes out of the motivation to say, well, we can't uh, put more and more and more constraints on our vector space. At some point, we might want to actually apply rules more explicitly. So what we constructed is a neural network for proving queries to a knowledge base, where the proof success will be differentiable with respect to the vector representations of symbols such that we can learn them from data end-to-end -end from that proof success, uh, and we can make use of provided rules in these proofs, and also induce interpretable, proof, uh, interpretable rules end-to-end -end from the proof success. So the approach that we're taking here is, uh, I guess, nicely summarized by Nando de Freitas two years ago. He said, well, um, basically what, what many of us are doing in deep learning right now is neuralizing stuff. So that means to implement a known thing with deep nets, Let's neuralize this, let's neuralize that, and train it. So I think a lot of the, the uh, neural program induction and maybe also program synthesis work that uh, Richard talked about falls into this category of taking something that's already out there and thinking about how we can turn that into a neural network. And then Jan Le Kuhn remarked, well, that's sort of like you know, what kernelized used to be. <laughs> and uh, we thought, well, obviously, then let's try to do both. So let's neuralize, in this case, Prolog's backward chaining algorithm using a radial basis function kernel for unifying vector representations of symbols instead of doing a symbolic comparison. Okay, so Prolog's backward chaining algorithm. I assume that everyone uh, in this room is familiar with it, but let me just give you, uh, again, the high-level picture. So we have a very uh, small knowledge base here on the left, which states that Abe is the father of Homer. Homer is a parent of Bart, and again, we have this uh, knowledge that every grandfather is a father of a parent. So what I guess on a high level, what backward chaining is doing, it's translating a query into subqueries using these rules. So if we ask whether Abe is the grandfather of Bart, this is going to, based on the third rule, be translated into two queries, namely, is Abe the father of some Z, and is that Z a parent uh, of Bart? So it's going to attempt that for all the rules in the knowledge base recursively, and therefore defining a depth uh, first search. 
a very central operation in uh, backward chaining is unification. So let's assume we have uh, this uh, query, namely, is Abe the grandfather of Bart? And we're trying to apply these rules. And note again that also uh, ground atoms, meaning facts, are, are rules with an empty body. So we are trying to apply the first rule. We're going to basically do a symbolic comparison. We're going to compare grandfather with father of, and that at this point will be already a failure. So that means if we had a upstream uh, proof state that so far has been successful, now there's going to be a failure, right? So we can stop the proof at this point. Well, the same would happen with the uh, second rule. So again, uh, grandfather of and parent of, they are two different things. So you know, we get a failure. And for the third uh, rule, we get this interesting case where we actually get a success. So grandfather of and grandfather of, they match. Uh, and we create these variable bindings, x to ape, y to bard. So that means given an um, upstream proof state where we don't have any variable bindings so far and it has been successful, we now get a downstream proof state where we have these variable bindings of x to ape and y to bard, and we have still a proof success. So here is an example that I care about. So let's say I ask about whether ape is the grandpa of Bart. So we would get a failure because grandpa of and grandfather of, they mean two different things. They're two different symbols. So given a successful uh, upstream proof state, we now get a failure in the, in the downstream proof state. So wouldn't it be great if we could somehow learn at this point that grandpa of and grandfather of mean a similar thing? So what we do is we replace the symbols with the non-variable symbols with vector representations. Right, so now we have a vector for grandpa of, a vector for ape, a vector for bard, and a vector for grandfather. And first of all, note that our, um, our upstream proof state is not just a success or a failure, but it's some continuous score between 0 and 1. And at the point where we compare grandpa of with grandfather of, we now have a little neural network that would take these two vectors and measure, for instance, their distance in a, in a vector space. Right, so the downstream proof state is, again, these variable bindings, so that we kept symbolic. We still bind x to ape and y to bart. But in the downstream proof state, we now have a neural network that would output a score between 0 and 1, based on how similar grandpa of and grandfather of are. So concretely, what we use is a radial basis function kernel. So that's uh, just the exponentiation of the negative Euclidean distance between the grandpa of vector and the grandfather of vector. We also aggregate that with the upstream proof uh, success. So assuming that this is, uh, there was a score of one so far, the new score would be the minimum of one and whatever the similarity between these symbol vector representations uh, is. Okay, so this is basically the most important uh, bit of, of uh, this end-to-end -end differentiable prover, taking unification and just thinking about how we can replace that symbolic comparison with a vector, uh, with a computation in vector space between uh, vector representations of these symbols. So how does it now fit into the, the big picture of backward chaining? So assuming that we start with some proof state where we don't have any variable bindings and the proof is successful with a score of one, we have the query that ape, whether ape is the grandpa of Bart, we're going to have this unification module instantiating a downstream proof state where we don't have any variable bindings because uh, there are no free variables in either the rule or the query. But we have this little neural network that tells us basically how similar is grandpa of to father of, how similar is ape to ape, how similar is bar to homer. We have something similar for uh, trying to apply the second rule. And again, for the third rule, we have this interesting case where we have this neural network that would at this point calculate how similar is grandpa of uh, to grandfather of. And we have the variable bindings of x to ape and y to bart. And we also have the knowledge that we still have to prove two subqueries, namely is, um, is uh, ape a father of some z and is that z a parent of bart. So we're going to ask recursively to ask the, the first question, namely is um, ape the father of some z. And at this point, um, we again trying to apply all of these rules. We have a very, uh, I guess, crude heuristic that forbids to apply the same uh, non-ground rule twice in the proof. This is where we really deviate from, uh, from prologue's backward chaining, but uh, this is just, I guess, a simplification such that this model becomes a bit more uh, tractable. Um, but let's say we apply this, this first rule. We now have an additional variable binding, namely z to, hom uh, z to homer, right? So this is when, um, when we basically compare father of to father of, we compare ape to ape, and we bind z to homer. So this is a new uh, downstream proof state where we took the neural network that we had so far and we augmented it with whatever, uh, I guess, calculation of similarity of these uh, vector representations um, was calculated. And then we still have uh, one question, namely, is uh, Homer indeed a parent of Bart? Uh, 
and we're again recursively trying to apply all these rules. So note that we also have to consider this other branch here where we applied uh, the second rule instead of the first rule, and that gives us, uh, I guess, another branch of proving. So basically what you can think about here is that we have a neural network that would um, basically represent all possible proofs up to some predefined proof depth. Um, and this is, this is a bit of a tricky point because we, this is clearly not scaling to uh, you know, applying lots of rules in a chain, right? So this is going to explode. Um, and uh, I'll talk uh, in a minute about how we can make this a bit more efficient by using GPUs, but at this point it's clear that uh, this architecture doesn't really scale to very large, uh, large bases or to uh, very uh, large rule sets. Okay, so note here that we have these leaf nodes. So leaf nodes are, for instance, the two on the top over here, right, these two guys, and also the four proof states on, on the bottom. And each of them have a neural network that, can, that outputs a score between 0 and 1 for that specific uh, proof, so that specific uh, application of, of uh, sequen our sequence of applications of rules, basically. Right, so we get, we get these scores, and then we can backpropagate uh, through that entire uh, tree, and I'll, I'll show you that in a second. The thing that I want to highlight here is that we can do something uh, quite interesting here. We can say, well, let's say we don't know this rule. We don't know about uh, the grandfather of uh, rule, but we might have some, um, some well, inductive bias that tells us, well, there should be some transitivity in the data that we could use to prove uh, queries to that knowledge base. So what we can do is here we can actually induce this logical rule very much uh, like uh, like the things that uh, Richard talked about, by, in our case, assuming that we know about the structure of the rule. So we're not iterating through uh, lots of rule templates. We just assume somebody gives us the rule template, uh, like this transitivity. And then basically what we have is we have a, a rule of you know, unknown predicates. So there are three unknown predicates, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. And we can just train the system as before. Or we can train vector representations of these unknown predicates such that um, queries to the knowledge base that should succeed will succeed and such that queries that shouldn't succeed won't succeed. So it's really much in, in, very much in the, in the spirit of uh, inductive logic programming at this point. But keep in mind that these are vector representations of unknown predicates. So the model is free to learn what it wants here for, for these uh, predicates, but for these unknown predicates, but it should make sure that they are useful for proving things that it, it should be proving. At test time, we can then look at the um, at the closest known predicate to get a human readable uh, version of this rule. Okay. Also note that the, the computation graph didn't change at all, right? So it's still exactly the same computation graph. The only uh, thing that changed is that we, we, that we don't know these predicates and we have to induce them from data. Okay, so I, I said that there are these leaf nodes, right? So a, each of these leaf nodes, um, uh, tells us about the variable bindings, but also gives us this computation graph, this neural network that spits out a score between 0 and 1. So to get a, a proof success for the, uh, for the uh, original query, what we do is we have a max pooling operation on all of these neural networks, and that gives us the score of how likely uh, we can prove this uh, ground atom, the query, uh, condition on the knowledge base and the parameters of our model. And then we have, uh, as uh, Richard, we have a negative log likelihood loss with respect to some target proof success, and we can backpropagate uh, through the entire computation graph, train this model end to end using stochastic gradient descent. So we learn these vectors such that the proof success is high for known facts and low for some sampled negative facts. Okay, so I said that this is going to blow up because, uh, you know, we. We, we try all possible rules. We even, uh, you know, we can't make any hard decisions at any point because we want to have it end-to-end -end differentiable. So we want to calculate the exact gradient of the proof success with respect to the vector representations of uh, symbols in the knowledge base. So this is going to blow up. One thing that we can do to make it a little bit more efficient is to actually really make use of GPUs such that we can batch proof many queries um, at the same time, also apply many rules at the same time. Again, quite similar to what Richard was talking about. So here we have two queries that we want to prove at the same time. We also uh, stack the predicate representations of uh, ground atoms in our knowledge base, uh, as, well as, uh, ground, uh, as well as predicates in our rules. Um, we stack the constant representations uh, for all the facts in our knowledge base. And then what we can do, we can calculate this radial basis function kernel uh, very efficiently just uh, by a matrix matrix operation. And then conversely, we get all the, I guess, proof successes uh, very efficiently just using one or two uh, matrix operations. And we also have to do a bit of housekeeping for um, uh, making sure that this variable binding works out. But this is, uh, yeah, this is very technical detail, so I won't go too much into details. 
OK, so we experimented with uh, four benchmark knowledge bases, three um, knowledge bases, the nations, the kinship, and the UMLS uh, knowledge bases have been used for, uh, I guess, uh, evaluating Markov logic networks. And there's the country's uh, knowledge base, which has been used uh, specifically to find the limits of these neural link prediction models. So let me uh, quickly explain how uh, this uh, country's data set has been um, constructed. We have a test country, such as uh, Belgium, we have a uh, sub-region such as Central Europe, and we have a region such as uh, Europe, and we want to know is that test country in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so for the first uh, task, what uh, happened is that we removed the knowledge that this test country is in that uh, region, and we have to infer that, for instance, by looking at its sub-region and inferring that that sub-region is in a specific region. So that's quite uh, simple because that's a hard rule that we can always apply. But then we can also remove this information about the subregion. So now we have to take this test country and we have to look at neighboring countries of that test country and at the, the region of, of these neighboring countries. So this is a soft rule. This won't hold every time in, in, the, in the data. And then we can make this uh, even slightly harder by saying, well, we also remove that information of neighboring countries. So now we have to uh, look to a neighboring country, the neighbor of that country, and then go to the region. OK, so these models are implemented in TensorFlow. We have uh, this complex model, the neural link prediction model by Trulan et al. We have uh, the end-to-end -end differentiable prover that I uh, explained. And we also have a slight variation that I'll talk about in a second. But um, let me just uh, emphasize again that we can write down these rule templates. So we can assume that in our database or in our knowledge base, in order to prove queries to that knowledge base, there should be certain implications, transitivities that are useful for proving queries to that knowledge base. So these are the templates that we use over here. And note here that, OK, here for the country's data set, I exactly used templates that correspond to certain multi-op rules that I would like to induce from the data. Um, but I would argue that this gives you a very flexible way of in incorporating your uh, domain knowledge and inductive biases into these neural networks, which is otherwise uh, quite hard to do. Uh, the numbers that are here in front is basically saying instantiate three of these parameterized rules. So you can induce up to three different rules at this point for the country's data set. And for the others, up to, let's say, 20 rules of that particular structure. OK, so after we train these models, we can also look at their vector representations. Uh, so this is what people generally like to do with word to vec They project it into some two-dimensional space and then see you know, how, the, how these uh, vector representations cluster. Uh, I think there's nothing uh, fancy going on here. There's nothing interesting, uh, except that yeah, maybe given that we've trained these models from the neighborhood information, we actually did see that Belgium is close to Germany, Luxembourg, and so on, and very different from, let's say, Sweden and, uh, and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina also. Right? So we, we can look at these, and we can see the similarity of these vectors with respect to other vectors. OK, so we ran complex, and then we ran our end-to-end -end differentiable prover, and we saw, well, it doesn't really seem to work. <laughs> so we are basically on par. So we get the uh, same results, actually, uh, on UMLS and nations. We are slightly better on this country's data set and uh, much worse on the kinship data set. So that was a bit disappointing, but at the same time, uh, I want to argue that it's still interesting because we can induce logical rules, right? So the neural link prediction model complex might perform uh, slightly better in, in certain situations, but it wouldn't be able to tell you uh, the kind of logical rules that it induced from the data. But then we sat back and thought a bit about, OK, what might be the issue here? Um, well, it seems that it's maybe quite hard to train these vector representations just from the downstream proof success. So what people do in these cases, usually they come up with some auxiliary losses. So what we do here is we t make sure that all the vector representations that we learn are also used um, in um, used to make predictions using the complex model. So complex here becomes like an auxiliary task uh, for the vector representations that we use in the prover. But it's important to mention that at test time, we only use the end-to-end -end differentiable prover. Right? So it's not like an ensemble model. It's just an auxiliary task that we, that we uh, use to make the optimization a bit easier. So that really pushes us above the bar. So now we get uh, um, yeah, state-of-the-art performance for human as uh, kinship and countries, and we're slightly worse on nations. But what I said is that the most, uh, I guess, exciting part for us about this is that we can actually afterwards look at the induced rules. And I just want to, uh, I guess, emphasize a few. So for instance, here we indeed have this uh, multi-op rule that says, well, if you want to know the location of a country for the third task in the country data set, you have to look at neighboring countries of the test country and neighbors of that country and then the location of these, uh, these countries. Right? This, this, this nice recursive rule uh, that, that we can use in, in, in proofs for queries to that knowledge base. And for our UMLS, we get these transitive relationships. Uh, so if some drug interacts with another drug and that drug interacts with yet another drug, we can infer that the 
you know, two outer drugs are interacting with each other. And I have to say that particularly these, these kind of rules are really hard for neural link prediction models to, to capture. Okay, so let me just in the last three minutes give you an outlook where does that lead to, uh, us to. So one, um, I guess, nice property of having an end-to-end differentiable model is, as uh, Richard was saying, we can connect that to other modalities such as uh, vision and language. So what I would really like to see over the next, uh, I guess, years or so to come is having models, question answering system models where we can ask, well, you know, my patient is not, not responding after three days of codeine treatment. What could have happened? Well, you know, we have some, uh, you know, whatever model, neural uh, end to end differentiable prover or some reinforcement learning engine or whatnot that queries into structured data, also gets explanations from, from humans, maybe in first or logic form, but maybe also in natural language and also reads lots of publications, the Wikipedia, to come up with the answer, which is morphine intoxication, but more importantly also gives you a explanation, right, which is, well, codeine is metabolized to morphine, some uh, mutation uh, in CYP2D6 can cause ultra-rapid motorization, ultra-rapid motorization can lead to morphine overdose, and a morphine overdose is an intoxication. So to summarize, uh, we propose various ways of regularizing vector representations of symbols using rules, and then I spent uh, the second half of the talk to tell you about uh, a neural network that's constructed uh, from uh, insp taking inspiration from Polak's backward chaining algorithm um, to prove queries to a knowledge base where the proof success is differentiable with respect to vector representations uh, of symbols, such that uh, we can, um, you know, apply rules in a symbolic way but uh, unify in a in a vector space, and we can learn these vector representations of symbols using gradient descent, induce rules uh, from data using gradient descent. And there were also various optimizations. I did talk about batch proving. I didn't talk about tree pruning because of time constraints. Uh, but yeah, for future research, I think it's interesting to think about more about these heuristic to, heuristics to scale these methods up to larger knowledge bases and also to connect these uh, to, for instance, recurrent neural networks to prove with natural language statements. Well, thanks for your attention. <laughs>